Okay. All right. We got lots of people in tonight. Very nice to see you all again. I hope that everybody's doing well. So tonight is our second training. And tonight we're going to be touching on event planning and recruitment. So overall, we want you to feel confident in your event planning and recruit as many people as possible um, and include intersectional organizing into, um, into your planning and organizing. So I already reminded everybody that we're, um, we're recording. So if you have to jump out or you know someone else who needs to see this video, it will be available on the website after, um, after we get it downloaded and put up there. Um, <clears throat> so as we all are checking in tonight, everybody, um, pop into the chat and let us know where in the world is your RISE event. Um, just want to see where everybody is coming from this evening. So throw those in there. Dana when I started. Georgia, nice to see the Portland. That's Washington, New York, Atlanta. It's nice to see everybody that we've been talking to in email. <laughs> That's awesome. So tonight we're gonna have a really interactive training. Um, we're gonna have a slide presentation. And so I'm going to share this link into the chat. And for those of you on the phone um, who can't, uh, who can't see it in the chat or who are you know can't don't have access to a computer this evening um, we will alert you when we're doing an interactive part of the presentation and we will um, let everybody who's just joining from the phone kind of chime in so we'll be reading things and making sure that people on the phone are getting the same information that people who are seeing the slide presentation so when you see that I shared this in the chat um, go ahead and click on that and open that window in your browser and then when there's some interactive parts where we're gonna be asking you to fill in some sticky notes and do some really fun stuff. So there'll come a point in when I'll remind you to go to a certain slide and, you know, and start getting involved. So if everybody wants to do that, that would be super helpful. And I'll give everybody a second to do that. Um, and while everybody's kind of getting that slide presentation up in their browser, um, I just want to touch on the Hamez principles again because it's something that I kind of we kind of talked about last week but this week you know we wanted to do a little bit more of a deep dive on that and if you're not familiar with the Hamez principles we'll share it in the slide presentation then it is available in the organizing toolkit for those of you that are on the phone um, but basically the Hamez principles for democratic organizing were adopted in 1996. Um, 40 people of color and European American representative met in Jemez, New Mexico for the working group meeting on globalization and trade. And the, it was hosted by the Southwest Network for Environmental and Economic Justice with the intention of hammering out common understandings between participants from different cultures, politics, and organizations. Um, to, it's kind of a just an all-inclusive, you know, how to inter bring intersectional organizing into. Yeah, Jackie, you're sharing your screen there. <laughs> so if you want to close. Not share your screen, that would be great. Can everybody still hear me okay? Jackie, could you go ahead and unshare your, your screen? Okay. So, all right, so moving on just a little bit to the Hamez, back to the Hamez principles. So the number one thing is to be inclusive. And that's if we hope to achieve 
ju just societies that include all people in decision making and assume that people have an equitable share of the wealth and the work in this world, then we must work to build that kind of inclusiveness into our own movement in order to develop alternative policies and institutions. And this is one of the most important things I think that we can talk about because these are very, very important to me personally. Like I try to follow all of these things in all of the organizing that I do. And I hope that everybody organizing RISE events decides to do the same thing. Um, the second thing is emphasis on bottom-up organizing. And that's making it important to reach out to new constituencies and to reach within all levels of leadership and membership base of the organizations that are already involved in our networks which leads into number three, which is let people speak for themselves. We must be sure that relevant voices of people directly affected are heard. Ways must be provided for spokespersons to represent and be responsible to the affected constituency. And it's important for organizations to clarify their roles and who they represent and to assure accountability within our structures. Number four is work together in solidarity and mutuality. Groups working on similar issues with compatible visions should consciously act in solidarity, mutuality, and support each other's work. Number five, build just relationships with, among ourselves. We need to treat each other with justice and respect, both on an individual and an organizational level, in this country and across borders. Defining and developing just relationships would be a process that won't happen overnight, and it must include clarity about decision-making, sharing strategies, and resource distribution, which leads into number six, which is commitment to self-transformation. And this is the ability to self-crit and to change from an operating on the mode of individualism to community centeredness. And we must walk our talk. We must be for the values that we're struggling for, and we must be for justice, be peace, and for community. So those are just some really important things to remember as you're organizing your RISE events. And with that, I'd like to introduce our trainers this evening. Tonight we have Amira, and she's coming to us from Puerto Rico this evening, and she's going to be talking to us about event planning tonight. And then we have Daniel, and he's in Brattleboro, Vermont, and he will be talking to us about recruitment plans and all that good stuff. So right now I'd like to hand it over to Amira to get started into the event planning portion. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about event planning, but first I want to mention briefly what are the objectives of this training. Um, by the end of this hour and a half, we're hoping that everyone feels comfortable with the process of planning an event and gains the necessary tools for a successful event planning process. Um, and we also are going to learn the importance of having set event goals and how these can fit into your goals of working on a broader campaign. And we're also hoping that people can gain confidence when inviting people to their events and have the opportunity to share ideas for recruiting attendees. Um, and now we're going to do um a fun online exercise i'm gonna be i just shared the slides on the comments again and i want you um to go into our slides um i'm gonna give you a few seconds so that you can click on it and open it we're on slide number six And on that slide, you are going to be seeing different colorful um, squares, some, some colored boxes. And in there, I, we have two questions. One of them is, um, what are the qualities of a successful event? And the other is, what are the qualities of an, of an unsuccessful event? So um, choose your color, choose whatever square you want, 
and let us know what are the qualities what what do you think in, in one word what is what makes a, a successful event for you and what makes it unsuccessful and if anyone on the phone wants to add anything um feel free to take yourself off mute also you can add stuff in the comments so far we have qualities of a successful event is that they're they have coalition building um they are focused they have a focused achievable outcome it unites the attendees um it celebrates celebrates com communalism <laughs> and achievements um and the qualities of an successful event is lack of motion if the event doesn't have a clear point to it, um, the focus is unclear to observers, it's not fun, it's poorly timed, uh, has lack of originality, um, and if anyone on the phone wants to add anything, again, feel free to say something. Another quality of an unsuccessful event um, is it deteriorates into this court. Does anyone want to add anything else? Do you agree with this? For people who have the, the camera sign, can I see a thumbs up if you agree with this? Nice. <laughs> Great. Okay, so let's continue on to uh, slide number seven. And we have a little reflection there, a little question. Um, and it's, how can your event build a stronger permanent an active climate movement in your local community? And I don't want the answer to that right now, but um, keep thinking about this question um, because as the training goes, we're gonna be talking about a few of these points and we're gonna come back to this question at the end and hear your reflections and your answers. Okay. So let's dig into event planning. Um, there are a few advantages of having a set and clear plan when we are planning an event. Um, first of all, um, when we have a clear plan, we have greater group involvement. So that means that everyone knows what's going on and can be part of of the planning process instead of just one or two key leaders doing all of it and feeling all the stress that event planning causes. Um, and when having greater involvement and more people knowing what's going on, you have a greater rate of event success. And having a set plan is also very important because an event, uh, a successful event helps move existing or new campaigns forward um, because events are tactics that they're just tactics that fit in as part of a larger campaign plan and having goals for these tactics help us plan something bigger and something that matters and something that's not just like one occasion but something that helps us reach our final goal um and uh, planning events with no set goals it won't mean anything because it will be just like planning a party or a hangout when you 
plan a party, you don't have key goals for it. The, I mean, the only thing you want is to have fun for a while, for a few hours. But a, a climate organizing event should have a better plan because we don't want to just have fun for a few hours, but we want it to mean something. Um, and let's talk about goals. Um, goals uh, make our organization and our events stronger. So when we're done with all this event planning process, we're not burned out and our members have, are not tired and burned out. And uh, we are left after all this planning process with a structure organization support that is gonna help our upcoming work instead of just like creating a huge event to at the end have the same group of members and the same group of leaders and have to start all over again. And to be able to set goals, um, we need to ask ourselves um, a few questions and these questions will depend uh, if we are talking about event goals or organizational goals. And both of these have to be very clear and quantifiable. And uh, when I say organizational goals, I mean the goals that you have for your group, for, for your organization. Do you want to have a bigger network? Do you want to gain more members? Stuff that is going to make your group stronger. Um, and you need to ask yourself when you want to set the goal for your organization, you have to ask yourself, how is this event going to make my group stronger and better? Is it going to help me recruit more people? Is it going to help me be more visible? Is it going to help me gain more followers? Um, and the event goals are what we want to gain from the event in specific. Like, how do we know we've impacted our community with this event? And this in specific can vary a lot. You can be in a very small, very conservative town and have 20 people show up at an event, and that can make it a successful event because maybe it's the first climate event that happened there um, and we can have a huge city and expect that we need at least a thousand people to know that we've impacted the community with our event so that's something that's very unique and personal to each group in each different city um, another thing that we need to ask ourselves is how do we use this event, this event opportunity to fix local issues? Um, what's our ongoing fight? What do we want to fix? And how are we going to use this event for that? Like, um, are we going to get petitions signed? Are we going to uh, put pressure on elected officials? What are we going to do? Um, to move forward in our campaign and fix what we care about. Um, and we also need to ask ourselves what makes this event important in our area. Is it um, the only climate event of the year maybe, or the first one, or the biggest one, or the first one that's different? Um, but in general, go goals are super important. They matter a lot. Um, and uh, I know uh, many event hosts can feel isolated and feel that like, hey, what's my event gonna do when I'm just on a small town planning this by myself? But um, when we have set goals, we're making a difference. And if the government is not taking um, bold and urgent climate action, we need to beat the fight. And the fight is going to be won if we have set goals. Um, because RISE is not just one occasion, it's not just September 8th, 
it's part of a whole movement that lasts every single day of the year for years to come. So we need to um, plan for the future um, and tie all the efforts that we're putting into RISE it's to the rest of the things that we want to accomplish at a local level. And uh, there are three different types of event goals. Uh, first, we have action goals. Um, uh, and those mean uh, having uh, X number of people at the event or providing a particular kind of experience for those participants. We have organizational goals, um, which means finding new leaders, reaching new communities, um, creating a bigger network, educating our community about a specific issue, and change-making goals, which is getting a decision made and a, and a local fight, whether it's a, a fight that you're already working on or a fight that you want to work on in the future. Sorry, could you repeat real quick the uh, organizational goals? I was trying to write them down and I didn't get a chance. Yeah, Thanks. so organizational goals are uh, what we want to do um, to make our organization better. So do we want to use this event to recruit new people or to find new leaders or to create a bigger network? or to educate people about the issue that we're working in. That those are organizational goals. Thank you. No problem. Um, and uh, if you're following the slides, we're gonna be on slide number 11 right now. Um, and to make this event planning process easier, apart from deciding um, the goals that we want to have for this event, there are some questions that we need to ask ourselves so that we can create our own timeline and be able to do things step by step at an appropriate pace that lets us have a successful event and not be too stressed or have to do a thousand things the week right before the event. So some of these questions to ask ourselves and ask our group when planning an event is first, um, will you invite any special guests? And that can mean anything from speakers to politicians to the media, who are you inviting? And uh, you need to ask who will create the agenda? Like what's gonna happen? What, what hour will it, will it start? How long will each part of the event last for? Um, and uh, collaborate with the people who are planning the different sections of the day so it's not just one person planning a whole day event if that's your case if it's just an event for a few hours then maybe you have a different situation and you don't need too many people being in charge of different parts of the event um, you need to ask yourself what materials and funding do you need? What do you need to make that event happen? Um, what do you have and where are you gonna get the rest? And answer those questions and choose the, uh, the response to create your own personal timeline. Um, and if you are on the site, you can see a sample timeline. Um, that's a spreadsheet that can help you um, figure out when things need to be done by. I'm gonna copy it in the comments. And uh, this, um, if you're on the phone, these materials are gonna be available also in our trainings website. So don't worry, you can have access to them when uh, we upload this training recording, um, we are also going to add all these extra documents. Um, so I wanted to hear from you um, if you could type this answer 
in the chat. Um, what kind of event are you thinking about? Are you thinking of doing a walk or a rally or a march or a concert or anything? What are you thinking about? Let us know in the comments. Can we have a rally and march combo? We have community gathering in a park, beach party, that sounds fun. <laughs> um, bike events followed by a rally focused on transportation, rally with art, culture, education festival, and underachievers 1K marathon with donuts and coffee, uh, march and rally, and with or without town hall um, in Eugene, Oregon, there's going to be a short rally, rotating teachings and demonstration. I love all these ideas. They are awesome. And we also have rally with coalition partners. These are all great. I love this. Um, I am not sure if everyone on this call is has their ideas 100% set and ready to go. But if you're still thinking and wondering about what to do with your event, you can find here on slide 12, I use full documents on how to um, plan creative tactics. So I'm gonna be copying it here on the chat again. Uh, I, I, we have another one, walk and poets for she moves me and music. That all I love all those ideas. Um, but if you don't have an idea yet, you can access this document and uh, um, just check it out. And uh, I hope it can be useful um, for you when if you wanna like create something different if you're still thinking about hosting an event and you don't know exactly what's going to be calling the attention for the people in your area i hope that document is useful uh, but now i wanted to open the space for questions um if you have any questions up until now um please write them in the chat so that I can help answer. And if you don't have a question right now, there's gonna be more spaces for questions later. So if anything comes up, you can also ask later. One person has a question. Can we register people to vote at our event? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. And a suggestion on that would be also to reach out to your local League of Conservation voters, reach out to League of Women voters, reach out to some of your local organizations that focus around electoral politics and see if there's a bunch of people that they already have trained and ready to help register people to vote. But I would absolutely encourage everybody to register people to vote at their events. Does 350.org have a fund to finance events until we can raise funds at the events to repay? <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't quite work um, that way. Um, Rita, where is your, what, where is your event? Maui, oh, okay, are you 350 Hawaii? Awesome, okay. So um, there is, um, there may be um, funding coming available for um, our local teams to fund some things that you guys need. And all of you at this point, um, will be, will have a rise coach, um, someone who helps you through your events and <clears throat> Rita, I'm going to look yours up here in a minute. Um, but I, I know that we can, um, we can help all of our, 
local teams. And it may not be financially. Actually, okay, yeah, your rise contact is Daniel. So <laughs> I know that, yeah, it's me kind of, I see that. So he can help you with that stuff. Um, you know, come up with a budget, send it to Daniel, um, send it to your rise coach. We should be, you guys should all have emails in your inbox, um, either from myself, Amira, or Daniel, um, or it, it, may, it might be another person on our team, Asada. But um, most of us have emailed you guys already and said, hey, we're your, you know, we're from Rise 350 and we're here to coach you through Rise. So if you find yourself in financial straits and you need help planning a fundraiser or you want to talk to someone about budget stuff, um, definitely email us and let us know. Um, I'm going to move on some of the questions here. Can I get a copy of all these other chats too? <laughs> um, well, we don't copy all the stuff that we posted in the chat tonight um, will be posted on the trainings website and I'll share that website at the end. Um, can we charge a small fee to cover expenses? You know, that is a tricky question, especially as if you're a C3 with a fiscal agent. Um, usually those things are paid for by your fiscal agent. But um, yes, sponsorship would be great also. Um, you know, if, if you can secure sponsorship ahead of time, we encourage you to do that rather than um, charge a fee to come to the events because a lot of people would rather I would rather see a donate bucket you know like you if you guys are tabling and you have a table and you're presenting material on a table have somebody man a donation bucket and throw donations towards you know towards the event or towards your team but we definitely I think charging a fee to cover expenses is a little in the legal gray zone so can we have candidates speak at an event now that's a good question and oh Tom from ATL hey um, so that's a, that's a C3, C4 kind of thing. And we have the, I don't think I have it pulled up in my tabs right now, but we do have the RISE legal C3 and C4 FAQs. And I know that Daniel is your RISE coach. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to write down on a, on my notes here um, to make sure that we send that to you. Now it depends on having candidates speak at your event. Is Here's the things. Here's a couple of things about that. So if you invite, if you're a C3 organization and you invite a Democratic nominee for governor, say, you have to invite their opposition. You have to invite both sides of the aisle. You have to invite all of them. Otherwise, you get into that legal territory where you're kind of crossing a line. Um, if you have a C4, now that's totally different. Then you can, yeah, there, Daniel posted it. Nice, C3, C4 guidelines. I knew we had it somewhere. <laughs> um, those guidelines are awesome for everybody. Um, and I will make sure that those get posted also because that if you have a C4, then you're allowed to lobby, you're allowed to go endorse candidates and things like that. So really, um, I think that's kind of a, a, a per organizational kind of thing that you guys need to figure out with your, whether you have a C3 or a C4. And then, okay, and then Rita just posted out her beach party. Cool. All right. I think we finished up all the questions that were typed into the chat for now. Um, I'm going to move us along so that we stay on time this evening so that Daniel has plenty of time to present and we have time for questions at the end, um, along with some follow up things. So um, with that, I would like to stay in your slide show because Daniel is going to be walking you through the rest of that. And with that, I will turn it over to the amazing Daniel. Cook. Hello. If you can hear me wave uh, two hands in the air. All right, sweet. Um, I don't know about you, I kind of hate webinars. Um, they can sometimes be really boring and passive. I, but I think it's been really great to get the questions from you so far, to have you kind of put some feedback in some of the charts. And you know, I enjoyed what Amira had to present. And what I'm hoping in the next, I don't know, 40 minutes is to present some material, but also like hear a lot from you and ask you to interact with a few little activities. Uh, I thought we'd kind of start by stretching. So if you're sitting down and you can stand up, why don't you do that? If you can't, or it's not convenient right now, you can uh, wave your arms around. All right, nice. Everybody, yeah, very limber folks. Very good. Um, okay, cool. And if you're on the phone, um, I'm gonna trust that you did that. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you all about recruitment tonight. Um, when we're thinking about recruitment, you know, you could also use the word like promotion. It's like, how can we get people involved in our rise events? And most of those people are probably going to be involved as like people that come to the event. Some though are going to be involved as like volunteers who get involved in like the planning process or also in the um, like day of kind of process. So, so I guess when we think about recruitment, we kind of hold in both of those ideas. Um, and I'm going to use the slides as like a kind of talking, like as a place to remind me what to say to you basically. Um, and then we'll use some of them as activities. So first one I'm going to look at is slide 14, which is all about hyping it up. So if you take a look at that, there's a nice pretty picture on it. Um, and we just want to talk real briefly about like, some of the different things you can do to hype up your event. Okay. So when you, when you're promoting your event, um, use different messengers, right? It doesn't always have to be the same person, you know, talking about it. They don't have to look the same. They don't have to sound the same. They don't even have to have the same message. You know, I think that the more we can broaden our attempt to, um, you know, to share this message, uh, the broader the coalition, the people we're going to bring in and we want a broad and vibrant climate movement um, the next thing that you can do to hype it up is to use beautiful art and you're really lucky because in your organizing toolkit which i didn't link on this slide maybe uh amy you can drop it in the chat um in the organizing toolkit there's a link to our arts toolkit and there are some beautiful beautiful posters on there that you can download and take to your local print place and print them up um, that's one of them that you can see on that slide. Um, I did a little tabling event uh, a few weeks back, just after the art kit got produced, and um, people were flocking to our table because we had all these beautiful posters. So there's that. Um, and then there are lots of different ways to promote your event, and we're going to get into those in just a second. And then finally, I think like if you want people to come to the thing, then you need to make the thing powerful and joyous, right? Like 350 is not an organization that is like glum. I hope not. I hope it isn't where you live. You know, so this isn't, you know, this is a time, right, where we could feel a great deal of despair and probably we do, but we can also, you know, go forward in that moment with optimism and joy and uh, a vibrant spirit. So. I encourage you to do that as much as possible. All right, back to the boring slideshow that I prepared for you. Um, who wants to read this slide called Recruitment Goals? You can raise your hand by raising your hand, or you could put a little star in the chat box and someone can read it for me. Let's see, who's going to read it? Who's going to be brave? Rita might read it, I think. What do you think, Rita? Come on. All right, thanks, Rita. Rita, can you read this slide to us, please? Uh, it's called uh, Recruitment Goals. Okay, but hopefully my Rottweiler won't bark in the background. Um, recruitment Goals, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Numerical, how many people do you want to take part? Relational, how can you use this event as a moment to build stronger relationships with particular communities? Logistical, how many volunteers do you need to recruit to make the event a success? And organizational, how can you use this as a moment to build the strength of your leadership team by bringing in new people? Thanks, Rita. Okay. That was kind of fun, right? Um, you know, it doesn't have to be me all the time. So, um, like I think some of those goals kind of speak for themselves. You know, um, you're probably all thinking about like numbers of people that you want to turn out. Um, I hope that at this point you're thinking about how to use this event as a way to strengthen your relationships. And I would really encourage you to think about strengthening relationships where they need strengthening, right? Where there are parts of your town or city that, you don't know so well that you don't see at your planning meetings or you don't see at your other kind of events. Um, and then logistical, you know, kind of speaks for itself. What, what kind of like, what groundswell of people are you going to need to get this thing done? Um, and then organizational, 
you know, you can think about building your internal like organizational strength. And I guess you can also think about like external organizing in terms of like your campaign goals and whatnot. So if you are working on a campaign, how can you use rise as a way to move that campaign forward? Okay. All right. I'm going to move us on to slide 16. Super important slide. Uh, who fancies reading that slide? You can raise a hand or you can put a little star in the, uh, in the chat. I'm going to pick someone in a second. I'll pick whoever looks most sheepish at this point. All right, I'm going to pick, uh, I'm going to pick Chris in uh, Portland. If, if you're able to, Chris, would you mind reading that slide, please? Sure, I thought you might pick me. I'm in a room with my screaming, screaming nephew, so we'll see how it goes. Um, working with a diverse coalition on recruitment. What do we mean by a diverse coalition? Why do we want a diverse coalition? Here are some resources to help you build a coalition, plus there's more training on this next week. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, that's good, that's good. I think, uh, I think that'll do. So like, so th what I did was I asked Chris to read a slide that actually there were questions on that maybe uh, you know, we don't have answers to right now. Um, so one of the really important things to be thinking about in planning for rise and you know in your climate climate movement work in general is about increasing the diversity of our movement. Um, so when we say a diverse coalition, well, what do we mean by that? I mean we mean people who are different ages, different genders, different race, ethnicity, uh, speak different languages from different places that you know are around where you are different classes you know there are lots and lots of ways to like quantify that um and why do we want a diverse coalition well it'll make our movement stronger and we also know that you know um i guess historically in north america the climate movement has looked kind of kind of white and you know maybe kind of middle class and um those are those are not the people principally in this country that are being impacted right now by climate um you know so we need to do a better job in building a more diverse movement and i hope that what i just said there is not like you know news to somebody uh on the call or maybe offensive to somebody but i went out of limb and i said it and uh and maybe alexis uh and maybe Avery will uh, take a look at this uh, later and edit that bit out. Who knows? Amy seems happy with it. All right. Uh, okay, so there are two links there. Um, one is the Climate Justice and Coalition Building with Frontline Communities document. Um, that's not like a RISE-specific document. It's one that we've worked up at 350, and it's a really great document and has links within it. So you can take a look at that. I'm not going to get into it in any detail right now. And then the next one is a equity and organizing checklist. Um, and again, that's the 350 document. And both of those are really worth a look. And then next week on our call, we have a whole call focused on diversity and inclusion. So great. All right. So on this next slide, don't look at it yet. Don't look. On the next slide, we're going to think about some ideas about how having a diverse coalition is going to make your event and your recruitment more successful. I hope nobody's looking at slide 17. Oh, I see one person's looking. Uh, all right, we can all take a look. There you go. We can all take a look at slide 17 right now. And there are lots of words on it, and I'm really sorry. Um, I'm going to share my screen while we do this. And can you all see my screen? Yes, I guess. If you, if you can see the screen, uh, go off the microphone, uh, go off mute and say yes. Yes. Sweet. All right. So yes. on this slide, there are a bunch of suggestions about how working in a diverse coalition is going to impact event planning and recruitment. And we're going to take a few minutes with this because uh, it's important and it's also maybe a little challenging. Um, so we can read through them uh, silently to ourselves. And when you've had enough time with them to get to grips with them, you can start to drag those little hearts that are in the bottom right hand corner. And you can stick a heart on anything that you would like to try. Uh, and for the folks that are on the phone, I guess 
I'll read them slowly. Um, and hopefully that'll be meaningful for you. And the folks that are on the phone, you'll be able to see this presentation um, maybe, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe the day after tomorrow, right, Amy? Um, so I'm going to work from the top left uh, all the way down. So we've got uh, one reason is involving partners in logistics decisions. Another is coalition members help with recruitment at places where they already have relationships. Another is we would list organizations that might want to know about the event and develop a plan to ensure that they're invited. Another is connecting with neighbors in the area where the event will be held. Um, on the second row, we've got uh, check with partner orgs around the potential need for translated recruitment materials and day of translation. So like if you get your recruitment materials translated, but don't provide translation on the day of, then there's kind of a, you know, a missed opportunity there. Um, in the middle, it says coordinate recruitment plan and share the work including the parts suggested by partner organizations. So like tomorrow night, I have a meeting uh, with my local group and a bunch of other partner organizations, and we're going to be getting their feedback on our plan, and we're going to be taking their feedback and incorporating it into our plan. Um, consider what images you use in recruitment materials, the age, race, ethnicity, gender, etc., of the people represented in photos and drawings. And then on the bottom, Find out what, if any, related events may be happening prior to the event you're planning, and then go to those when possible, right? Both to recruit people for your RISE event and also to build relationships so that we're not just asking people to come to us. Um, in the middle, think about the words used in recruitment materials that communicate who the we of the event is. And then finally, uh, consider connecting recruitment for the event with deep canvassing and relationship building. Okay, so I see uh, folks have placed hearts kind of all over. Uh, I'm going to give you just about 30 seconds more to grab. You can grab as many as you want to just do one and stick it on something that you're going to give, um, give a try. You have no idea how long this slide took to make. All right. Okay, now we're going to be super brave. Um, I'm going to pick the one that has the most hearts on it. Okay, I'm going to pick the one that says, uh, consider what images you use in recruitment materials. So would somebody who placed, so we've got, who do we have here? We've got Anonymous Turtle. No, that's not it. No, it doesn't tell me who they are. So we got this nice little green heart, this uh, sort of pinkish color and this yellow color. If somebody who placed one of those hearts would like to come off mic and tell us like why they want to do that or what they were thinking about. Uh, I just realized that Rita, it didn't work out for you. Sorry, Rita. Does anyone want to tell, tell me about the choice that they made? I see a raised hand from Amy. Anyone who doesn't work for 350 on Rise want to tell me about a choice that they made? I'll tell you something. It's a bit noisy in here, though. That's OK. Um, I, I put the, the translation one on there. We're planning on holding an event. We're on East Portland. And um, pretty much all people's climate marches and stuff like this have been downtown uh, forever. But this year we've partnered with, with a bunch of people in our coalition and we've decided let's not do it downtown, let's do it in East Portland. And there's a big uh, Latino population. And so like having recruitment materials that actually like work with that is gonna be important. Yeah. That's great. Do you have partners from that population in the coalition? Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, we've got a really good coalition with just about every every group you can imagine. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Chris. All right. You're on mute. 
Oh, I'm on mute. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, it's like, who's she saying is on mute? Oh, it was me. Um, does anyone else have a burning desire to tell me about where they placed one of their hearts? All right. For those of you I can see on video, can you hold up your fist? Oh, I just see Rita raised a hand. Okay, Rita, go ahead. Okay, so I live in Hawaii where um, white people are only 10% of the population. So if I put white people all over my posters, that would be a horrible thing. You know what I mean? So um, I better use Pacific Islanders or nobody would ever show up to my events. You know, if you look at all of the commercials on TV in Hawaii, it's all Pacific Islanders, you know. So, um, you know, putting white people on, on uh, posters would be really, really offensive. So if I was able to put the heart on there, which I realized I was trying to put it on your share screen, and not that. <laughs> I was putting it on the wrong one. So my bad, but uh, so so for, for that reason, um, you know, I would definitely uh, have to uh, think twice about what images uh, I use in those uh, recruitment uh, materials. Um, another thing is, uh, the, you know, the coalitions. You know, we're a small island, um, and uh, the same people turn out for all of the same environmental uh, events. So the same people that go to Sierra Club go to 350.org, go to uh, Maui Tomorrow events. It's all, it's all the same people, you know, but maybe the, um, the, the targets are a little bit different. But the people that are activists are activists, you know. So uh, the coalition building is very important, you know. So that's it. Great. Thanks, and Rita. Catherine? Yep. Catherine, did you want to go ahead and speak? Yes, if I could figure out how to do it. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Cool. Um, we, like you were talking about, we struggle in my group. Um, I'm part of an indivisible chapter, and we struggle kind of with, we're mostly white women. And um, something we've struggled with a lot is working on diversifying our group. And so I'd really like to place a lot of emphasis on reaching out to the groups that we have that we're not as connected to with this event. So sort of like lower income communities, because we're pretty middle class. Um, farmers, we've got a lot of farmers in my area too. So I put a heart, put hearts on a few of those things. Right. And like, I think this, the thing with this stuff, unless you've been doing this for a really long time, is it requires bravery because we're going to places where we don't maybe have relationships or we're stepping outside of our comfort zone. Um, maybe we're worried that, you know, we'll do it wrong. Um, but I think that we have to try, right? Because, you know, we need, we need a, a climate movement that looks like America, right? And sounds like America. Um, so, I mean, I can talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm anyway, whatever. All right, let's, let's move on. Um, that was really interesting for me to, get all that feedback and I enjoyed watching you uh, play around with all those hearts. So thank you for being open to it. All right, let's. Somehow you're muted again. I just said the most important thing <laughs> um, and you never heard it. And uh, now I don't remember what it was. No, I just read what was on the slide. Um, so we're going to move on to thinking about how to get folks to show up for Rise, okay? Um, and like, the nice thing about this is, you know, you all came to this call, like, I think the vast majority of you on this call have planned an event before and have some thoughts on how to get folks to show up to it. Um, and even if you haven't, I bet people have tried to get you to go to an event, so you have some ideas as well. So let's go to slide 19. And it's another little post-it activity. There's a big gray box. You're not allowed to peek underneath it. Um, and you can click on one of those bubbles and type in it. And the thing that I want you to type is how people 
find out about events where you live, right? So not thinking about some random place, thinking about like actually where you live. And we're gonna try not to duplicate. So if somebody puts something in one of those that you were thinking about, um, then tough, it's taken. So somebody's put Facebook, no one else can write Facebook now. Um, and we're just gonna keep one idea per bottle for now. So yeah, I see a leopard is writing about ads on the radio and the newspaper, billboards. Oh, canvassing says anonymous manatee. Uh, bulletin. Blast. Oh, coffee shop. Yeah, yeah. Mass texts. Tabling. Did you guys cheat and look at all the answers? I don't know. Phone banks. Super scary. What else we got? We got about what five or six spare boxes. Let's keep a couple of boxes spare and we'll make sure that we get folks from the phone as well. Um, posters. All right, let me give you 10 more seconds. Anonymous Wombat says Facebook. Oh, we've already got Facebook, Anonymous Wombat. <laughs> Instagram. Interesting. All right. Okay. Um, if you are on the phone, we're looking for ideas about how people find out about events where you live. Um, so you can like come off mute. Um, I don't know, Amy, if you want to unmute the people on the phone and, and give them a chance to speak up and we'll stick their ideas in here. All right. I'm unmuting a couple, unmuting people, on the a couple people on the phone. Anyone on the phone, on the phone wants to contribute? To contribute. Let's see. Hi, this is Elaine from Juno. 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 Hey, Elaine. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi. We're big on postering. We're a small we're town of thirty thousand. So, so I am thrilled, I am thrilled to, to you know to you have, know, your, have your. Uh, Time. Time. That's been fabulous. Been fabulous. And uh, uh, we also, also go on public radio, and sometimes we buy a spot. You can be have an announcement on public radio uh, for free, uh, but the uh, DJs uh, need to pick it up. If you pay a certain amount, you get an enhanced PSA. So sometimes we do that. Nice. nice. Thank you very much. And we've got two more squares that we can fill in. Anyone else on the phone? Action Network. Action Network. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess so. All right. Okay. Uh, so maybe we'll uh, mute those phone participants and um we've got one little box left let's see if we can fill it in fact i'm gonna what do we have here in this orange box that says aqn what, what are we trying to say there i'm not 100 percent sure telling friends yep yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, so here's my little cheat sheet over here that I'm glad that nobody peeked at. Uh, so let's see. Did we say emails? Did we say emails? Do I see emails anywhere? E, e blast down here. All right. Do I see phone banking? Yes. Texting. Do we have texting? Is texting up there? Oh, there it is. Anonymous Manatee is on it. Uh, flyer in. Do we have flyer in? We have posters, so maybe we'll put flyer in with posters. If somebody would do that, that would be wonderful. Uh, table in. Is table in there? Yes. Oh, you guys are experts. Action network. Yes. Social media. So yeah. Uh huh. Did anybody say videos? No. I, I just shared a really awesome video about Rise from 350 um, today, and then I included it in an e-blast that I sent this evening, and people, uh, people are into it. So 
take a look at the 350 uh, Facebook page and there's a really great rise video for you to share. And one thing that I want to mention is go into other people's events. So like you can go to like one of your coalition partners meetings or events and, you know, make an announcement at that event. Um, or you could go to, you know, a church group that you're part of and, and make an announcement there. Um, so that's, you know, that's another thing that you can do. Um, one thing that you can do is you can invite folks to text the word RISE to 83224 and then they'll get updates. Right, Amy? That's how it works. Yeah, that's how it works. Cool. All right. Okay, so now we're going to go to the next level. Um, we're going to do another little fun placing things on things activity. Um, so maybe I don't need to share my screen. Maybe you can all just you know, do it on your own here. And you can stick a heart next to something that you're already kind of doing and feel okay about. And then a little thought bubble on one that you haven't tried or don't feel 100% about. All right, go. Facebook, Facebook. Radio. Somebody's not so sure about Franks. Yeah, that's scary. You gotta talk to people. Tell them friends. Yeah. I don't have so many friends, so uh, uh -huh. somebody likes to put a canvassing. Oh canvassing. Oh, somebody's made that heart really big. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Uh -huh. Canvassing's a little scary. Mass texts. Yeah, they can be hard to coordinate, I guess. Uh -huh. Speaking religious groups. See, this is like a fun webinar. Imagine that. Billboards. Cool. Let's take about another 10 seconds. And then just like we did before, I'm going to ask a couple of people to speak up and, and talk a little bit more. And maybe this time we'll focus mostly just on the ones with the thought bubbles. Um, we'll see if we can allay your fears. Okay. All right. So um, let's pause. Can somebody who um, was not so sure about um, phone banks um, speak up and tell us tell us what they're thinking? There were two people, and it's okay. Phone banks are scary. Okay, Rita, take yourself off mute and tell us all about it. Um, I've worked phone banks before, and um, we'd have to get a hold of some phone bank technology. And uh, a phone bank database, usually you get, um, I don't know, I guess voter registration database. I don't know if that's... Uh, what we would get a hold of. It's hard to find people who can man the phones. It takes training. Uh, it it's, takes quite, quite a lot of organization and um, quite, quite a lot of teamwork effort. I've, you know, I've been involved with that and I, I don't know if I would have the resources uh, on my small team to organize that. So, I don't know if that's where my resources would be best spent. Yeah, okay. So when I think about phone banks in terms of like getting people to show up for an event, I would use the list I already have. So like sometimes what, I, what we do in our local group is we send out an e-blast and then we see who opens it. And the people that opened it that have a phone number, um, if we're feeling really brave and we have time on our hands, 
uh, we give them a call and um, we, you know, we actually make that. Ask That's different. On. That's different. I thought you were cold calling. Yeah. Um, you, you know, these are people interest. we already have relationships with. Oh, then that's a no-brainer. That's and, easy. you know, Brody's 350 Hawaii list would probably, you know, be useful in that regard. Yeah, that, then, then that's not so scary. I'll put a heart on it. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, I muted myself again. Silly me. Uh, let's see. What about... Um, Somebody wasn't so sure about Action Network, and maybe I don't know. Maybe they don't want to talk about it right now. Um, I, I find Action Network a little tricky, uh, so maybe there are other people that also find it tricky. It's not the most intuitive thing in the world. Um, does anybody want to speak up about using Action Network as a way to recruit people to show up the Arise event? Okay, I'm hearing crickets. Uh, so how I would use Action Network to get folks to show up, um, you know, like when people say they're gonna come to your event when they RSVP, um, you know, they give you their email address, uh, a minimum, and they probably also give you their phone number, maybe. Um, and then, you know, you can use Action Network to send emails to those folks. Um, if you use a different email program, you can also download the RSVPs and then take the information from there and, you know, and use it on whatever email program that you want. Um, and Amy is reminding us that last week on the training, we talked all about Action Network and the training is still available at the RISE Trainers website. And there's like a video and an Action Network guide and I learned some things on, on that training and fixed up my event page a little bit while we were doing it. So I would recommend it. All right, okay. Uh, let's see, how are we doing for time, Amy? We've got about 16 minutes. 16 minutes? I know. <laughs> well, but that's not all me, right? So why don't I zip us along? Um, so it's pretty clear to me from that activity that we all have a sense of how to turn people out I would encourage you to, to um, take another look at this slide on the, um, in the little cheat box. I put in brackets like when it's good to do these things because these things don't necessarily happen all at the same time. And if you look in the um, timeline that we shared earlier, that also has like a recruitment timeline on it um, that suggests like different times to do these things. So. Um, they're not all created equally, that's for sure. Okay, um, all right, this next thing on slide 20 is all about sharing recruitment tasks. Um, so one of the good things about working in a coalition is that you don't have to take on all of the work on your own shoulders. You know, we can share these tasks out. And in so doing, you know, we're gonna reach more people. Um, and we're probably going to be more effective in how we communicate with those people because that coalition partner is going to know how to talk with that particular group of people. Um, so one thing I would kind of encourage you to consider is creating shared materials to make your recruitment a distributed activity, which is sort of like what 350.org does and then provides for like local groups. You know, we create materials with our partners and then provide them to you and then you use them and you know so you would kind of do your version of that and in the organizing toolkit um, you know there, there's stuff in there and links to um, links to like text for messaging um, and, and that kind of thing so I would encourage you to consider making your recruitment a distributed activity by creating shared materials um, one thing to do with that is to like list out the roles, you know, so maybe these people in these coalition partners are gonna be responsible for emails. Maybe these people are gonna be responsible for flyers, um, posters, you know, maybe these people are social media people, you know, and so rather than have one person take on all of that, uh, which is a lot, spread it out and then you'll do much better, I think. Um, I think the bullet points are all fairly self-explanatory. Maybe the last one, 
not so much. Um, so when I mentioned earlier that we are thinking about recruitment, mostly in terms of like showing up for the event, um, we're also probably thinking a little bit about how to recruit volunteers. Um, and you know, you can do that through Action Network itself on the form where people like fill in like their name and whatever. You can add a button that says like, you know, do you want to volunteer? And then when people are RSVP in, if they click yes, then you'll follow up with them and, you know, plug them in. Um, another way to do it is you could create a Google form that you send out with any e-blast or put on any of your digital material that people can fill out um, to volunteer. Or there, there are like a load of volunteer websites available, like signup.com um, is one. And you can recruit volunteers that way. All right, moving on. Uh, okay. Oh boy. This is, this is important. All right. We're on slide 21 and we're almost done ready for questions and just one more slide. So this is all about tracking and communicating with the folks that say they're going to show up. Um, I don't know about you, but like, you know, the number of people that say they're going to go to a thing doesn't always match up with who actually does go. And you know, it's not always the same people that said they were going that end up coming to the thing. So it's really important that as we move through you know these next several weeks that you stay in contact with the people that say that they're going to come to the event and you can do that through action network uh, through your event page um, on your event page you want to make sure that you're collecting the information that you need so if it doesn't already have um, like a phone number field make sure there is one if it doesn't have a volunteering field make sure there is one and the resources that are linked to the bottom will show you how to do that. Uh, kiosk mode is something that people are very excited about. Um, kiosk mode is basically a way to kind of um, make your event page when somebody RSVPs, like say you had your computer at a table that you know that you were using for a table in event. Um, when somebody RSVPs and they click, you know, yes, I'm coming. Um, it then takes it back to the beginning rather than going through this lengthy process. So you could have like a line of people um, and they will all be signing up. And there's more information on how to set up kiosk mode in the Action Network guide that's linked there. And also there's a video of it last week. Um, and then I guess the last thing I want to say on this slide is like how to use Action Network and Facebook um, concurrently. So like Action Network's good at collecting the information of people that are gonna show up. But in my opinion, it doesn't really help so much in terms of like showing how many folks are going and like who's going. Whereas Facebook events show like who's planning to go and you know, so maybe people get motivated because they see their friends are planning to go. Um, but for us, it doesn't collect like data about like, you know, it doesn't give you their email address or anything. So it's hard to, to stay in touch with those people en masse. So I would recommend on your Action Network page, having a link to the Facebook event page, and on your Facebook page, uh, on your Facebook event, having a link to your Action Network event for people to RSVP, and hopefully between the two, you'll catch everybody. And that is pretty much all I have time to say for you today. Um, so I'm gonna, be quiet now and give you a little bit of time to ask some questions. Uh, so I guess like we did before, we'll ask the questions in the chat and then Amy will uh, facilitate. So questions about recruitment or if you had uh, an event planning question that's been bubbling away, you know, maybe now's the time for that as well. Wow, no questions, really? I think there are oh, questions. Oh, here, there we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. You want to, should we go ahead and try that one? Okay, so what are good ways to identify good partner organizations? It's a good question. Um, who do you want to reach? You know, you, you, you talk, this is Catherine, right? Uh, you talked a little bit before about it being, you know, mostly white middle-class women. Um, so 
go to the places where you know where the people are that you're looking to connect with um and maybe go you know with like a humble heart um and and do that you know so i think that's something for your group to decide like you know who are the communities locally that we haven't historically been good at connecting with and how can we, you know, how can we go there and like, like I said, like go with a humble heart. Other questions? I'm going to read one aloud that was sent to me um, just from somebody anonymously. Um, they're wondering what their rides event should look like. How long? A rally, a march, then a rally, speakers, entertainment, a stage, vendors. And I have to say that's not a silly question. Like that's something that I think all of us as organizers ask ourselves every single time we go to organize an event. Um, so I don't know, Daniel, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, th this is a question that like I've been kicking around, I suppose, in coaching calls. And I think it's, it's whatever makes sense locally, you know, um, there's no like one size fits all. Um, rallies and marches are mostly what we know in this country when it comes to this kind of thing so that's not you know really the only thing that we could do um there's that creative action toolkit that was linked in the slideshow earlier and will be available and that's a pretty interesting sort of playful document because it, it's not like a list of things you can do it's a series of like kind of provocative questions that are going to get you thinking about your event um, but I think, you know, if we're working in groups, then we need to consider like what our group is interested in. You know, so if one person in the group is really wanting to do a thing, but then like the eight other people are not interested, then, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, in my group, we have several people that are really interested in transportation. Um, and that's kind of what we ended up focusing our event on. I had a, a call with another group um, last night and several of the, that group are really interested in issues to do with water. So they're going to kind of have that be their focus. Um, so yeah, there's not really a one size fits all question. If we can find out who asked it, maybe we can coach that person a little further off the call. I see a big question from Chris. I'm not even sure I can read it all. Let me, let me take a, a minute. All right, so Chris says, I've been involved with ballot initiatives and elections, and it seems the most important thing to get people to get out and vote is direct voter contact. So we phone bank and door knock and canvas. So that's a lot of hard work. And when it comes to events like this, people never seem to use those tactics and instead revert to posters and social media campaigning. Any reason for this? I don't know. Maybe we're comfortable with it. Maybe it is, it's easier. <laughs> Right, it's easier to like share a social media post than it is to canvas and door knock and phone bank. Um, I think you know diversity of tactics, right? Like we want to do, we want to do as many of these things as we have the capacity for. And it sounds like, yeah, I mean, well, we know that 350PDX has a lot of capacity for doing some really great stuff. Um, so maybe we can follow their example and be brave with the things that we choose to do to get the word out and to connect with um, folks in our communities. And if people text RISE to the phone number, does it direct them to the local event somehow? I guess. Amy, tell me more about that. <laughs> you know, I think um, that is a question I'm going to have to ask Emily. But I, from what, I'm, what I know of texting the RISE stuff is that it gives you updates when things are happening within RISE and directs you to the map or um, to a training or to a hype call or, you know, to anything that we're doing. So, um, Chris, I'm your group's um, rise coach. So I will find out a definite answer to that and let you know tomorrow. Um, and then to also go back to some of the Chris's previous question, I also think, um, you know, that I, part of that is that it's the hardcore activists that get out and phone bank and door knock and like doing all the canvassing stuff. Like that's really, really hard work. And it's easier to get 
the moderate liberal crowd on social media and with posters and things like that for these events. And when we're looking for big numbers for an event, like, you know, if we want to bring 5,000 people to Denver, you know, then we use all of our tactics. We use, you know, the hardcore, those of us, we use phone banking and canvassing or texting or, you know, writing personal emails. But then we do a mass thing. We do a social media blast. We hit it on Twitter. Um, you know, we do all the things that we know will hit pretty much every group of activists. And I think that people revert to, you know, posters and social media because it brings numbers. Let's see, does anyone else have any other questions? All right, Amy. All right, I on one of the almost to the end of these slides, number twenty three was something that I thought was so beautiful. At the end of this was the reflection part. Um, how can an event build a stronger, permanent, and active climate movement in your community? And I think that's something that all of us on the ground should think about: is how we can bring not just use rise as a moment, but into our local community and our movement building that we have going for our groups and. If anyone has any thoughts they'd like to share on this, I would be super interested to hear it. But if not, just keep that question in the back of your mind while you're going through your planning and think about how you're going to use this to build momentum and push into your campaigns. Does anyone want to share? <laughs> I feel like we're getting towards the end, so everyone's kind of tired of you know the sharing. <laughs> Um, but I did, and then just a reminder to everybody, recruitment days are coming up this weekend and you don't have to do it this weekend if you don't have the capacity or the time. Um, but the guide is on that last slide. If you want to do it now, if you want to do it in a couple weeks, whenever your group has the capacity to do that, you have the option to kind of recruit people. Um, all the resources mentioned today are linked in this slideshow and will be available um, on the training website. Um, along with the recording of this call. And we usually get all of that stuff up the following morning because it takes a little bit of editing and getting some things through our Digi team to get that all worked out on the website. Um, and thank you guys for coming to this training. We hope that you guys come to next week. Um, and next week is going to be really exciting and fun also. That's coalition building and inclusive engagement. And I think all of us can learn something from that one. Um, and then our last question, if you guys want to pop it in the chat, um, what's one thing that you're taking away from this call? Um, something that you learned tonight, something how you're feeling, um, anything that you just want to share that you're taking away from tonight? Energy. Yes, me too. <laughs> Give everybody a minute to inspiration. Yes, oh, that's awesome. Motivation, lots of great ideas and energy. Youth, yes. Oh, you're welcome for all the resources. <laughs> Everyone at 350, the, the whole team of people that works really hard to bring all these resources to you guys, and we are very happy to provide them for you connection also it is it's nice to see you guys on camera and it's nice to connect with i see you know people that i talk to an email like um devin patty and eugene and you know uh, 350 pdx and just everybody you know on here it's, it's really nice to put a face um to the email address <laughs> or the phone <laughs> um so with that i think if nobody has anything else then we will close out tonight's call thank you for coming and check the website out in the morning for all the extra links and resources and the video if you want to share it with any of your other organizers. And also on that same training website, make sure you sign up for next week's training. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.